Hi there, Mark here from AmericanNarration.com and in today's video I want to answer a common question that we get each and every year. It's a, it's a great question and we really want to address that in this video today. And the question is, can you over aerate your pond? Now, over many years I would answer this in a simple way and say not within reason, but that answer doesn't go far enough. It, there's some specifics we really need to get into here that it may not affect everybody in, let's say, the United States, which is typically who we deal with for customers, but it could affect a great number of people in the southern United States and in certainly as temperatures continue to warm up, it seems like in various uh, locations around the country, maybe more and more people would be affected by this, so we wanted to talk about it uh, in greater detail. So the answer to the question, can you over aerate your pond? Yes, you can. And this could come from a couple of different things. It could come from being a little bit too aggressive on the aeration side, maybe oversizing a system. But it can also come through properly sized setups when certain conditions exist. And it would typically have to do with weather. So over aeration is possible when the weather is very hot and sustained. And we'll get into some specific temperatures you need to watch for in a bit. But in the southern United States, you will typically see these temperatures throughout the summer months. And it can run on for days, weeks, maybe even longer. So uh, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. You can over aerate a pond that is relatively shallow in depth. Those tend to be the most problematic when it comes to over aeration. And if you have fish, they would be the main consideration in this video. There are other issues that can come from aggressive aeration in ponds. Uh, algae blooms could be precipitated at least short term by aeration, but in this video we want to talk more specifically about issues for fish and then you can obviously over aerate if the system you're putting in is sized incorrectly and we'll talk about that in a little more depth too so here's what you want to watch for when it comes to aeration for fish you want to watch for extended temperatures that are above 85 degrees to 90 degrees and, and even higher. And this might come when your atmospheric temperatures are probably in the 90s or above. You can check your water temperatures, of course, but you want to keep an eye out as the temperatures rise. Shallow ponds tend to be more affected by this. Uh, and when I say shallow, I mean ponds of about 8 to 10 feet deep or less. Obviously, as you have more depth to work with, if you've ever swam in a fairly deep pond and gone down closer to the bottom, you know as you go down in a unaerated pond at least that you have these thermocline layers and it gets quite chilly down to greater depths. Shallow ponds don't have the luxury of working with those great depths and those colder or cool temperatures when the pond starts to get mixed. And that's part of the issue here is uh, when you start to aerate, you will do two things. You will oxygenate the water, which is something you need to do and would want to do in hot weather, but you also will start to mix the pond, and we'll discuss that a little bit further down the line here. The other thing that will be a part of this equation is you've got some desirable fish in there that you want to protect. Maybe you've spent some big money on stocking, spent a lot of time in nurturing this uh, this ecosystem along and those fish are vulnerable when you get into some high temperatures. You could also have algae or weeds which in their own way they affect the dissolved oxygen levels in the pond environment. They would tend to make these numbers swing higher and lower through a 24-hour cycle and so they need to be considered. They're not the main point of this video but they should be part of the equation if you have them in, in there. The main thing to remember 
in this whole discussion is that fish have limits. And as I said, when you start to reach very hot temperatures, you do want to oxygenate that water. They will need that uh, because a lot of times the most lethal problem for fish is low oxygen. And everybody knows that they need, you know, some degree of decent dissolved oxygen levels in there. But you also have to understand that many fish, this includes bass, catfish, crappie, they're quite similar in their numbers if you look at some of the data, but they experience stress in water temperatures at around 85 degrees. That's when the stress can start. They can handle very short-term sustained temps, and this is water temperature, by the way, of 90 and above. But if it's sustained for very long, uh, you can start to see mortality in, in these fish. And this is going to vary by not only the species a little bit, but also by the individual fish and what, their, what stress level they can tolerate. But these numbers are fairly general and will give you an idea of when you start to see air temperatures that exceed these numbers and your water temperature starts to heat up at the surface, uh, these fish are going to start to get stressed when these numbers come on. Trout especially are very sem sensitive to temperature. Uh, they will start to stress out around 68 degrees just under 70 degrees, and sustained 75 and above is, and this is in Fahrenheit, by the way, is dangerous for them. So they are a cold water species that, you know, you need to keep their environment uh, cold in some part of it. And as I say, the, the main issue that we're having in these hot climates and in these hot conditions is not that the aeration is a bad thing to have, but through the oxygenation, we're sustaining fish that way, but we also are mixing. And when you mix water that is warm on the surface and cold at the bottom, you get a fairly neutral temperature. If that temperature overall doesn't exceed some of these numbers that I just gave you on where st fish start to get stressed, then you're okay. But shallow ponds don't have the luxury of depth, and therefore most of the pond is probably warm already. And when you mix it fully with the hotter uh, temperatures from above, the entire pond body warms up too much, and you may start to exceed some of these numbers. Okay, So what we can do basically involves limiting the mixing. That's the main focus of what I'm trying to do when I give these suggestions. We still want to oxygenate, but we definitely don't want to mix as much. So, number one, probably the simplest recommendation is to run a subsurface aerator only at night. In a 24-hour cycle, a pond will go through ups and downs of, their, of its dissolved oxygen levels, and it typically will show its lowest oxygen levels in the overnight hours. That's when it drops and it will tend to be higher during the day. So it makes sense that if we were to run an aerator in a limited amount of time, we want to run it at night to sustain the oxygen. The other part of this is that during the hottest part of the day, let's say early to mid morning to dusk in the evening, when the sun is up, when it's the hottest part of the day, if we avoid mixing in that time period, we can at least try to keep the pond cooler that way and not heat it up so much. So aerate only at night. The second thing you can do optionally is to, if you have a single diffuser system, you could move that diffuser from a typically center position, usually the deeper position, to a more off-center, more shallow position. And again, you're, you're oxygenating a certain portion of the pond, but you're limiting the mixing, especially in the deeper part of the pond, by doing that. So that's another option. If you have a multi-diffuser system, these diffusers with individual air lines going out to each one will have a dedicated valve on each line. And so you can shut one off and turn one on. You can direct airflow however you want. And what I would typically do in this case is I would shut off one diffuser or maybe even two diffusers and run most of my air through the single more shallow position diffuser. And you should be able to do this with systems powered by quarter horsepower pumps as well as half horsepower pumps. If you get beyond that, it might be a bit much to try to push too much air using something like a three-quarter horse or a one horse through a single diffuser. You probably won't want to do that. 
but it does give you the versatility to, to direct the airflow however you need to. And again, we're, we're trying to limit mixing here and yet oxygenate a certain portion of the pond. If you have a single diffuser system, the other thing you could do, it's a little more uh, laborious, but you could elevate the diffuser, again, probably moving it off center, but elevate the diffuser to say three, four feet under the water. So again, you're limiting the mixing down low and providing oxygen. Alternatively, you could use something like a surface base fountain or aerator to basically oxygenate just the upper part of the pond. And again, the lower part of the pond, especially as you get down to eight, 10 feet, it's not gonna be mixed very much. And what I'm speaking of in terms of a fountain, um, display fountains could definitely aerate don't get me wrong, but if I'm wanting to aerate for fish with a surface fountain, typically I'm going to go to a dedicated aerating fountain. These obviously have a pattern to them and they're not bad to look at, but they definitely uh, are more fountain-ish than a surface aerator would be, which just creates a very low dome of water, moves a lot of water around. But both those could be used in cases where you only want to aerate the upper portion. And what happens is the fish can go into whatever area of the pond they need. If they need more oxygen, they can move into the oxygenated zone. If they need it a little cooler, they can drop down into the cooler area. And so it gives them options compared to a pond that is heating up all over the place. Might be well oxygenated, but they're going well beyond their temp level. Uh, temp tolerances and so you can run into problems with that. The other thing that I wanted to talk about in this video is this idea that more is better. More is not better when it comes to aerating a pond or lake. Now it's true that under certain conditions if I'm aerating an industrial setting, wastewater, something like that, and I'm looking for the highest oxygen transfer into the water to help with a number of issues. Okay, that's one thing. But when we're trying to aerate a natural ecosystem with fish and other critters in it, more is not necessarily better. One of the stories that came out in our industry, and it's circulated for a while now, it wasn't one of our customers, but it's, it's a good example of what you can run into with this kind of thing. So I think it was a fellow in Texas had a four, five acre pond. He installed a four or five diffuser aeration system. I think it was five diffusers. And that should have set up well for him. He was working with bass primarily. And he was getting along fine. Everything was going pretty well. But for some reason, he decided that he wanted to increase his aeration, possibly to increase the growth rate of the fish. I don't know. But he added another five diffuser system to this body of water, basically doubling his aeration. Now he was, in my mind, well fitted right off the bat with the five diffusers, but he added another system just like it. And in a short while, during hot weather, he started to experience some issues. Fish started to die off. And he was basically mixing the pond too much, too fast, too aggressively. And again, he was getting heat build up, they went beyond the tolerance that fish could handle. Oxygen was probably excellent, but that's not the only part of the story. So he basically showed that you can definitely go overboard with this kind of thing. And in my experience, when you size these correctly, we're taking the surface area and the depth into consideration. We're looking to turn the pond over about once per 24 hour period. It's a relatively subtle action. It's not a uh, a very aggressive um, technique, I guess you'd say, to try to move this water around and get everything oxygenated well. So it's a very subtle action. It looks very subtle from the surface. Underneath, there's a good bit going on, but again, we're not trying to stir the pot too much here. We're also trying to keep in mind why we're aerating. In certain cases, we may, may want to aerate a little bit more than the norm, but most often, if we get this thing pretty close and if we do our due diligence and we dial this in doing some calculations, we can get something figured out that will be nicely aerated without being too low or too small, 
but not too large either. There's also this trade-off of as you go up in size to these systems, the cost to operate goes up because the pump is bigger typically. And, you know, you're paying for something that you don't really need. The other part of this thing that can come into play is when you introduce these aerators into a, a stagnant pond, particularly an old pond, you will start to mix the water. Uh, down at the bottom, you'll start to mix it top to bottom, and it's important to introduce the systems into a body of water gradually, especially in older ponds with fish, especially in warmer weather. You want to be very slow and pragmatic about this, and in all the instruction manuals that are provided with these systems, no matter the brand, they talk about this, where you might run, for example, 20 to 30 minutes the first day, Second day, you would increase this runtime up to about an hour, 40 minutes to an hour, and then shut it off. And each day, you increase the runtime until you're up to 24 7. And this way, you begin to start the mixing process without disturbing too much too fast. And once you're up and running well, typically you're through that introductory period, and you don't have to worry about the mixing too much. Stuff will start to settle out or you can work on getting things, uh, getting things clarified in the water by some simple additives that the aeration will support, but it just helps clean everything up. And so just be sure to introduce things gradually into new systems and understand that too much, too aggressive of aeration in a, in a fish pond, for example, can definitely be problematic. So as we close, if you don't know what you need, it's better not to guess. Be sure to get in touch with us. Ask us if, uh, if you need recommendations on sizing a system. We do need the pond size, surface area, and depth. And typically, if the pond is, let's say, two acres and larger, or ultra shallow, maybe six feet, eight feet deep, and fairly large, we probably would suggest doing a, a mapping on that. There's no cost or obligation on your part to do it, but it definitely helps get the specifics down to know where we stand and uh, know what will work best. So reach out to us anytime at American Aeration. We're happy to help. And uh, if you have more questions, you can leave those in the comments below this video. Thanks for joining me. Hope you have a great day wherever you are.